So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you for being here today as we continue celebrating our Women in Marketing um, series entitled Take Your Seat at the Table. My name is Karen McFarlane, and I am president of the American Marketing Association of New York, where we every day work to inspire, support, and celebrate women in marketing. We started the series for one purpose, to help women flourish in their careers. Our goal is to amplify female voices, perspectives, and accomplishments so that more women have even more opportunities to take their rightful seat at the table. And today, we welcome Bernice Clark, Chief Marketing Officer of the New York City Economic Development Corporation. The insights Bernice will share, I describe as leadership gold for marketers who wish to motivate and inspire their teams and rising marketers who want to learn the skills they need to reach new heights in their careers. I'm also pleased to introduce Young Me Park as our host. Young Me is an adjunct lecturer at Columbia Business School and Rutgers Business School, as well as a fellow AMA New York board member. Young Me's background spans three continents in diverse industries. She has held leadership roles with brands such as American Express, Burger King, and Levi Strauss, and with education companies such as Sesame Workshop and Nations Academy, and in technology and new ventures. First up is the interview with Bernice and Young Me. This dynamic duo have, duo have so much more to share. After the interview, there will be a 15 minute long Ask Me Anything session, which as the title suggests, provides you with the opportunity to hear more from Bernice Park. To ask a question, take a look at the lower bar of your screen. You'll see an icon with three dots. Click it and you'll see the Q&A button where you can type your question. Also feel free to use the regular chat to introduce yourself and share comments with other participants. Before we get started, we want to thank our partners who support our mission every day. Thank you to our Diamond Event partner, SmartLink, who has a technology firm providing translation management services around the globe, has been a staunch advocate for this program since its inception. And a big thanks to our premier partner, Greenbook, who partners with AMA New York year round sharing critical research and insights marketers need to power their very good decisions. And thank you to the AMA board and our team of talented volunteers for their continued contribution and commitment and dedication to making programming like this possible. Your enthusiasm is contagious. If you're not already a member of AMA New York, I invite you to join and help us shape the future of marketing. We need your talent and voices as an active part of our community. And with that, let's turn our attention towards the main event and listen as Bernice Clark takes her seat at the table. Bernice Clark is Chief Marketing Officer at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, a company that has been on the front lines of innovation, climate change, workforce development, and healthcare, even before they stepped in to assist New York City with the COVID-19 pandemic. Bernice's path is an intriguing one that took her from top ad agencies right out of college to executive roles at well-known retailers to this critical role that serves as a New York City lifeline. Throughout these transitions, you'll find a common thread, her focus on the human experience, and not just from a buyer standpoint, but also from a leadership one. Today, Bernice is sharing how her penchant for leading from the side builds the critical relationships teams need to perform at the highest levels. You'll also receive sage advice on how to transfer your skills to new, unpredictable roles. Hosted by Young Me Park, let's listen as Bernice Clark takes her seat at the table. All right, Bernice, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm, I'm fine. So nice to see you again. Thank you. It's nice to hear your voice. <laughs> All right. So... Um, for starters, just to get us warmed up here, can you tell us a little bit about the um, NYCEDC and what you do over there? Sure. 
So I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of the New York City Economic Development Corporation. And after this, I'll just call it EDC because mm -hmm. it's so much easier to say. Yes. <laughs> um, and our organization, it's, I've been here, actually, I just passed my one year anniversary oh. with the organization on June 3rd. So Congratulations, good for wonderful. you. Um, and our organization is really engaged in, I'd say, four core mandates. Um, one of them is to be very involved with strengthening communities, really helping neighborhoods address needs that have been longstanding. Um, one is really around sustainability and particularly dealing with the effects of climate change on New York City. Mm -hmm. um, and we do believe that climate change is real mm -hmm. and so put a lot of effort in along with other partners um, into addressing it. Um, one other major initiative is around workforce and job development and particularly helping New Yorkers be ready for 21st century jobs like cybersecurity. Um, so jobs that are going to be increasingly and ongoingly important um, in our economy. And the other area is innovation. And you know, and for us, innovation could be in industries like life sciences um, that are really beginning to become much more of a lifeblood of New York City. And mm -hmm. certainly that innovation and those partnerships in industries like life sciences has helped us to really be um, a strong partner and, um, you know, to really have impact within this COVID-19 crisis mm -hmm. um, because it really helped us to be able to help New York City and to help New Yorkers mm -hmm. um, for some core needs, whether it was ventilators. Mm -hmm. um, our organization was very involved in helping to develop um, and ultimately to help to get produced ventilators when none were coming from the federal government. Mm -hmm. And um, also with gowns and face shields, we worked with a number of smaller businesses and production companies. I mean, it's, it's really just amazing. I mean, we know the New Yorker spirit. Mm -hmm. The New Yorker <laughs> spirit is there's a crisis, you know, what can I do? Right. And, uh -huh. you know, just working with different small businesses and manufacturers um, and Broadway, um, uh, Javier Munez from Hamilton, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. seamstresses from Broadway, just in making gowns and face masks mm -hmm. and face shields. Um, and then now we're very, very involved in mm -hmm. the test kit. Mm -hmm. um, endeavor and mm -hmm. have really gotten involved in the design and now the manufacture wow. of test kits and and now even as a marketer very involved in working along with the city hall comms team mm -hmm. on the test and trace effort mm. um, to get that message out to new yorkers oh so my it, goodness it, it this i had no idea <laughs> these three months have been um you know, incredible, not only just for the impact that it's had on um, communities in particular mm -hmm. in New York City, but I think it's really just galvanized our mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the organization created a number of cross-functional teams to set up uh, how we could source and manufacture. And, you know, I'm, I, I, I have really found it, um, it's, as hard as it has been, just as an overall crisis, mm -hmm. it is, it's really been, um, you know, meaningful to know that the organization that you're working for is, is really impacting the life of New York City. That's incredible. That's incredible. I mean, the, what a wonderful resource for New York City during this time of crisis. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we also, it sounds like your organization is also doing tremendous things for the long term. So I'd love to hear, how did you end up in marketing? Ah, yes. So I got involved in marketing. I after college, um, actually during college, mm -hmm. one of my favorite classes, and I, and I took my, this class in freshman year, mm -hmm. you know, more as a 
distribution credit, try out a class. I took sociology mm. and I loved it. Mm -hmm. Loved our, loved my professor, mm -hmm. um, Viviana Zelizer. <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, she just, the, the whole topic of why do groups of people do what they do? Mm -hmm. Why do they make the decisions that they do? Why do they have the thoughts and the perceptions um, that they do? I, I just loved it right from the very mm -hmm. beginning. And so I knew right then that I wanted to major in it. Mm -hmm. um, now, I didn't want to become a sociologist, mm -hmm. but when I was coming out of college, I went to business school mm -hmm. and I actually I went to NYU business ah. school. And at the time, um, almost everybody who was at the business school was a finance major. Right, right. And I was a marketing major. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we used to say the marketing majors, the few, the proud, you know, <laughs> we loved it. And, um, you know, what I, what I took into the marketing courses was just this understanding and thinking about people mm. and why they do what they do. Mm -hmm. And um, from there, I went into advertising. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I remember I was having interviews with different product companies and um, investigating those companies. And then I met a recruiter from the Leo Burnett company in Chicago, mm -hmm. and he just made advertising not only sound um i'm, I'm not gonna say something like fun mm -hmm. but inspiring mm -hmm. you know and i think what i found inspiring about doing marketing in the setting of an advertising agency now this is and i think it's changed a lot but mm -hmm. when i was went into advertising it was to be really a close business partner mm -hmm. and marketing partner to mm -hmm. your clients. Right. So to be right. involved integrally in their business, mm -hmm. you know, what would, what were their customers looking for? Who were their customers? Right. What were the demographics? What, you know, what did they think? You went to focus groups, mm -hmm. you helped to put together research. Mm -hmm. I remember when I worked on Kellogg's, I went, I worked on new business, um, new brands for mm -hmm. Kellogg's for a number of years. And I remember going to the plant, mm -hmm. um, you know, when right, a new right. brand was coming right. off the line, right, and, right. you know, and uh -huh. taking it into focus groups. So uh -huh. it was, um, it really appealed to me, not only because there was a business end and a creative end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that probably people um, don't know about me is that, um, my other major in college, mm -hmm. I went to Barnard, um, mm -hmm. was a, I was a piano performance major. Oh. oh there was this wonderful program mm -hmm. um, called Program in the Arts, uh -huh. and I majored in piano performance. So, mm -hmm. you know, so for my senior year um, projects, I had to write a paper for sociology and um, a piano concert for wow. <laughs> music card. <laughs> wow. Do you still perform? You know, I still play. Uh -huh. Actually, one of the things that I've picked up again during these last three to four months uh -huh. has been practicing again mm. and also teaching my two 13 year old boys mm -hmm. uh, lessons. Mm -hmm. I'm sure uh -huh. they're loving it. <laughs> oh, well, it, it, I, you know, if they're not now, I'm sure they will soon. You know, so that's what took me into advertising. Uh -huh. And also, I think I thought of it as a good way to get exposure to lots of different industries. Yes. yes. So I worked Definitely. on packaged goods. I worked on um, cereal across a, and also different targets. Uh -huh. I worked on kid brands right. and adult right. brands and all family brands and right. new products. Right. I worked in retail um, uh -huh. for Sears when I came back to New York, uh, mm -hmm. at Young and Root Cam, um, Colgate, Palmolive, KitchenAid. Um, you know, it was just, it, it, each business that I worked on, mm -hmm. I was able to bring something that mm -hmm. I'd learned previously in yeah. my career, yeah. but I also got to learn a new industry and uh -huh. a new way of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what kept it interesting for me mm -hmm. for a number of years, mm -hmm. almost 15 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. No, I, I understand that. I also worked in advertising for a couple of years and everything that you're saying resonates with me because when I moved over to the client side, um, my agency partners were among my best friends, you know, mm -hmm. they were just, we were, we had such close relationships. So, but then what happened when you left the agency business? So then when I, well, I ended up moving. Um, I was here in New York and then I got engaged to be married and my fiance got a position um, in Rochester, Minnesota at oh. the Mayo Clinic. He uh -huh. was working on their health systems as a project manager. Uh -huh. And um, so I moved out there. There wasn't really anything right for me to do in Rochester, Minnesota, uh -huh. um, but Minneapolis um, in Midwest in Midwest terms was mm -hmm. relatively close, mm -hmm. meaning eight miles away. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in Minneapolis, um, really, I mean, everything that's going on is very hard to hear about. It's, it's a, mm -hmm. I enjoyed it as a city. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a number of really great companies there, obviously. Mm -hmm. So a number of agencies, but also Target was mm -hmm. there. And Target owned Marshall Fields mm -hmm. department store at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. And from my experience of having worked on Sears in, when I was in advertising, mm -hmm. I went into the marketing group, um, running their uh, marketing planning um, and working along with their merchants. Mm -hmm. So I went to the Marshall Fields company, went there for, now that actually leads to a really interesting period though, mm -hmm. because six months after I came to Marshall Fields, then Target put Marshall Fields up for sale. Mm -hmm. And we went through a very long, process, mm -hmm. you know, with two suitors. Um, the May Company of Stores bought mm -hmm. Marshall Fields, mm -hmm. but then a year later, Macy's mm -hmm. Corporation bought the May Company. It's been a tumultuous period, you know, yeah. for a while. <laughs> and and yeah. that happened all in the space uh -huh. of 18 months. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I remember that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. At that point, yeah. the... Um, I was reporting straight into the CEO of mm -hmm. Marshall Fields mm -hmm. and had joined executive committee. And, you know, it, it really grew me as a leader mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and also grew my understanding of the underlying business mm -hmm. of retail. Mm -hmm. But also, I think I was still able to bring my sense of empathy and understanding of mm -hmm. the teams and just mm -hmm. how much change they were going through. Mm -hmm. And so just try mm -hmm. to always bring those two things together as mm -hmm. a leader, just that awareness of how change mm -hmm. affects people um, and yeah. giving them confidence that they can make it through. So that, you know, everything that you've said so far, it must have been wonderful to work with you because going through such a stressful business period and having that kind of experience and insight to manage the business, and it sounds like you definitely had the confidence of leadership, but also understanding the human element. Most people mm -hmm. don't have, you know, that whole package. So, you know, um, what was one of the, you know, more memorable experiences you had um, that you can share? Because I, I'm sure that many people could benefit from, from what you yeah, offered or gained. You know, I, I think one of, the, one of the moments in that, I mean, there were a lot of difficult decisions that had to be made from a business standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, not everybody stayed, right. Um, right. you know, at one, I mean, even the name change. So mm -hmm. this is an emotional moment. Yes. Um, uh -huh. so when the May company bought Marshall Fields, they kept the name, right. When Macy's bought Marshall Fields through the May company, yeah. they made, they brought everything into the Macy's family I, I know. and that mm -hmm. was a business decision. Yeah. But I know people were um, devastated by that. It was a uh, hard, yeah. and having lived in Chicago, yeah. I understood it. Yeah. Um, you know, but I think it was trying to keep the team focused on um, that the spirit of the company 
didn't have to change because mm -hmm. or of our division mm -hmm. didn't necessarily have to change just because the name had changed and just to stay mm -hmm. focused on that piece and mm -hmm. most of all i think as a marketer to stay focused on the customer mm -hmm. you know in some cases it was almost to to not be as focused on our own emotions mm. in that case, but really to think about what does this mean to the customer? Mm. If Marshall Fields is known for exemplary customer service, mm -hmm. how do we continue to bring that mm -hmm. um, as Macy's North? Mm -hmm. And you know, just to really focus on um, the business goals mm -hmm. in this case, but mm -hmm. to do it in a way that was um, mm -hmm. appropriate and right for us mm -hmm. as a brand and as mm -hmm. a team. Boy, you went through a bunch of interesting transitions from mm -hmm. advertising to retail mm -hmm. and now to a completely different type of organization. I, I mean, I never really, until you explained it today, I don't think I ever really appreciated what EDC did, but it always mm -hmm. felt like not a typical nonprofit. It felt more like a hybrid organization. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so those are pretty dramatic transitions. Could you, could you talk about how you manage that just from a, you know, pivoting perspective or, yeah. you know? Well, here's the wonderful thing. Uh -huh. um, I, and, and one of them is the nature of the work, I think, of marketing. Mm -hmm. And one of them is also the nature of relationships. Mm -hmm. So when I left Macy's, it was because the organization and retail was downsizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as I was looking into what's next, I actually, you know, at that point, I'd had a wonderful run in retail. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd done it for, I think, 14 years at that point um, and I didn't enjoy it but really was looking for a new experience mm -hmm. and you know what they say to you is to talk to everyone talk mm -hmm. to everyone you know find out what other people are doing mm -hmm. hear what's going on in their world and I spoke to someone who had been one of our HR managers at Macy's who had actually gone back um, had gone to Publicis, I think, as their head of HR. And they didn't have anything there. And honestly, I wasn't, you know, really looking to go back into advertising. Mm -hmm. um, but he was still in touch with another person who had, um, had been in HR at Macy's. And she was now head of HR at EDC. Mm. And so he mm -hmm. said, I think he ended up speaking to her maybe a day after he and I had breakfast. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'm trying to fill this CMO position at our organization. And he said, have you thought about Bernice? You know, she's looking <laughs> to do something new. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and, mm -hmm. she, and she said, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. I'd love that. <laughs> and so then we got on the phone yeah. and we started to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, really just started to talk about, and I looked up the work um, and the mission of EDC. And that's where then I think of marketing as so transferable. Mm -hmm. You know, again, because it's the thought process. Mm -hmm. And also there's the executional process mm -hmm. of it. There is the operational mm -hmm. part of marketing also. Right. And I came right. with that experience from having run operations for marketing. You know, so across all of those positions and my previous experiences, mm -hmm. I could look at a new industry, a new position, mm -hmm. a completely different world, mm -hmm. but also look at it in terms of how do I transfer those skills mm -hmm. um, and bring them into an organization that's at a very different scale right and a very right. different mission right but still think about it in terms of communications mm -hmm. and also think about it in terms of the operational piece of how do you do smart marketing mm -hmm. at a very different scale than right. what you've just done right so right. that is a great challenge to me yeah. and I'm, 
I'm also enjoying that. Also, um, you've been in leadership positions for quite a while. How did you, a lot of people are going to be interested. How did you get into leadership? And then how did you manage your, I don't know, your power or, you know, how do you, how did you manage your career from that point on forward? Hmm. So I think getting into leadership, um, you know, in the early part of my career, in a lot of ways, advertising had a very clear path. Mm -hmm. You know, like you start as an assistant account executive. Mm -hmm. They give you crappy things to do. <laughs> <laughs> you do them. Mm -hmm. You do them well mm -hmm. and with a smile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you move on to the next level. Mm -hmm. And then they give you more responsibility. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hopefully you're looking at what the people above you are doing and you're taking in how they've done it mm -hmm. and you start to think about how you can make that leadership authentic for you mm -hmm. you know and especially at the early part of my career almost all of my leaders were men mm -hmm. and you know while i looked at how they managed clients there were certain aspects as to how they manage clients that would not have been right for me, mm -hmm. a black woman, mm -hmm. to, you know, to interact with them on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I remember early on in my career, one of the things that I really tried to focus on was how was I adding value according mm -hmm. to what that client or that business needed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember when I was on um, Kellogg's, um, you know, obviously it's a sales driven business. It's a competitive industry. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the ways that I really tried to stand apart was just my knowledge of the history of the industry. And, mm. you know, and, and at some point the head of our business, anytime somebody new started on our business, um, either at our agency or at the client. I gave this presentation that I had worked on mm -hmm. um, that was like a 30 year retrospective mm -hmm. of the category of the industry, mm -hmm. what worked, what didn't work, um, lessons learned, mm -hmm. impact that it has going forward. Mm -hmm. So I think I just really tried to establish myself, not only in terms of as being somebody who could um, who could work well with other people, mm -hmm. but also who could have an impact mm -hmm. on the business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, that's what I think I really tried to bring into leadership. Mm -hmm. And then when I went into my next positions as an account supervisor, and then ultimately as an account director um, in advertising, I, I really just, you know, kept focusing on those same mm -hmm tenets mm -hmm. of, of running a business mm -hmm. and um, and also managing teams mm -hmm. and you know hearing what was important to my teams what they found frustrating um, you know advertising in particular can be a tough business mm -hmm. and yep. you know you put all your heart and soul into something mm -hmm. and then you go and present it and mm -hmm. not only just for creative people but for account people too yep. or media teams mm -hmm. and you know sometimes it goes extremely well mm -hmm. and sometimes it's a bust mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the human piece of it um is that that really can deject people mm -hmm. you know it, it you can mm -hmm. just really take their spirits mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. um and you know i just came up with we it just came up with different ways to help keep the team up you know sometimes it was just like a silly thing like mm -hmm. we would say on the way back from kellogg's we're gonna complain about this meeting from battle creek until we get to Paw Paw, when we're going to stop and get food. <laughs> Once we get there, we're done. We're done talking about it. We're going to talk about other things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's very good. That's very good. How did you learn about that people management part? Because not a lot of people seem to do that very well. Yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. You know, I think... Um, well, I'm the youngest of four, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Okay. And so you had a lot of wa lot of watching. A lot of navigating yeah. when yeah. you're the youngest of four. Yeah. Yeah. You no. Know, uh -huh. I think one of the things in it, and I joke around with this with my siblings all the time, um, mm -hmm. and other good friends who are also, you know, within. I mean, it's not a huge family, but mm -hmm. it, you know, it's it's a big enough family. Mm -hmm. And you also realize that you are not always the top dog every mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. And not just because of your place in the family, mm -hmm. just because when you're one of four, um, sometimes somebody else and th what they're going through, their achievements, their good days, their bad days, that takes precedence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think I just, I think I brought that even into leadership. Like I never mm -hmm. thought of leadership as my way matters the most. Mm -hmm. You know, I think every day I'm, I don't want to say proving my value, but mm -hmm. part of my value is also um, offering to help. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a little bit of this is, is from, you know, my background, even, you know, growing up in church, you know, mm -hmm. they often say this thing, servant leader, mm -hmm. meaning that right. to be a leader doesn't just mean standing up in front of people and telling mm -hmm. them to do things, do right. this, do that, do that. Mm -hmm. It also means, you know, seeing what needs to be done, mm -hmm. um, offering, you know, okay, you're doing this part of it. Would it help if I did this part of it mm -hmm. and jumped in? Mm -hmm. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've been part of the assembly line for mm -hmm. materials um, throughout my career, mm -hmm. throughout the time when I was at Macy's. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're putting together something and it's, it's a huge project sure. and it needs to go in front of the executive committee, mm -hmm. I'm right there, you know, three hole punching mm -hmm. and putting it in a binder mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that mm -hmm. matters a lot um, mm -hmm. to teams. Also being a woman of color, I know that there are lots of experiences that are not like that. And sometimes, you know, for lots of different reasons, I, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about blaming or anything like that, but um, being different can stand in your way. Have mm -hmm. you had any of those experiences? Yeah, I, I think early in my career, um, mm -hmm. so talk about other things that grow you. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when I first started in advertising, not only would I say that it was male dominated, mm -hmm. but also, so I was the only woman on my mm -hmm. first piece of business. Mm -hmm. Mm, wow. And then I was the only black person also. That I'm not surprised about, but I'm, I'm surprised that you're the only woman. But I was, anyway. yeah, uh -huh. my very first wow. piece of business. Wow. Um, and, you know, especially at that time, you know, creative teams, sometimes creative leads, mm -hmm. just would say some really awful things. Yeah. I mean, and they would say it to a number of people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It was almost sort of like a hazing type thing mm -hmm. and one creative director said to me um and leo burnett did have some rules about mm -hmm. like who could sit at the table who couldn't sit at the table who could speak in meetings i mean it was like, mm -hmm. my goodness wow um, yeah <laughs> yeah mm. um and he said to me you know we were sitting this was this wasn't even like a formal meeting mm -hmm. but he got there late and there were no more chairs mm -hmm. and he said to me I don't even know why you're sitting at the table you know you are and he didn't use he didn't use um a racial epithet he didn't do that but he used like you know some other term pond scum something like that mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and he said that to me mm -hmm. you know like you shouldn't be sitting at the table mm -hmm. And, you know, I think at this point, I'd probably been on that business for seven months. I had really worked to have my voice come out mm -hmm. um, in a respectful way. Um, you know, I'd gotten to know other people on the business, people who had been on it for a long time. And I realized what this was, that it was a hazing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no. 
I'm not going mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. mm -mm. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, well, I might be pond scum, but I've got the seat and you do. <laughs> Oh, good for you. What do you say? <laughs> so everybody in the room goes, yeah, you tell them. <laughs> and that was the last time we ever had that discussion. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that was a particular situation. Um, uh -huh. You know, there were, there were other, that one was almost more about like, just, I think just standing up for myself mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of establishing mm -hmm. who I was and how I was going to operate with mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and again, yeah, he was four or five levels higher than me. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, like, I'll respect you. Mm. And you're going to respect me. No, I, I love that you stood up for yourself with humor. I love that, you know, that that was very, very deft. Um, but in that context, we're going through a very difficult period right now. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, what are you thinking about that? And well, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, being a a woman of color, mm -hmm. um, this isn't our first situation like this. I know. Well, you know, how many hundreds how of many years. situations yeah. have there been? That's right. Um, and, you know, I think for me, what, what this situation, this current situation and the focus on it, and um, I think the heightened awareness mm -hmm. of what people of color and in particular black people mm -hmm. um, deal with, not only in, um, a work situation, which is a whole other thing, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but also just in your daily life, mm -hmm. you know, just how much stress um, is present in your daily life. How do you think you're going to be perceived? Does somebody think I'm going, that I'm something that I know I'm not, mm -hmm. but, you know, just um, the treatment that you may get that you just don't deserve. And mm -hmm. ultimately for so many, um, you know, obviously the, the ramifications and, and tragic situations, the deaths, you know, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's um, mind -boggling. unbelievable. Yeah, it's mind boggling. Yeah. It's are we, are, you know, are we human beings if we can behave like that? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, um, and as I said, this isn't the first time this has come up. And, and I think that's been a test of leadership mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether when I was at Macy's, there was this one situation and just having conversations with teams. Mm -hmm. um, I think offering a place for people to be comfortable to say, I don't really understand, mm -hmm. you know, what this situation might mean to you. Mm -hmm. um, like, I don't want to make somebody uncomfortable. I right. do want to encourage them, though, mm -hmm. to grow and develop mm -hmm. and want to be educated mm -hmm. about other people, just mm -hmm. the same way that I um, have had to grow up. I mean, mm -hmm. I think most people of color grow up mm -hmm. learning about other people. Yes, you have no choice, right? Exactly. Uh -huh. And so yeah. I think this, this, this situation, this most recent um, tragedy has now made people realize how important it is mm. for them, um, a majority population or group, to s understand more about the people that they see every day. And, mm -hmm. you know, we often think of New York as this melting pot, so diverse, it's this, uh, yes and no. Mm -hmm neighborhoods ultimately are not as diverse no. as we would claim that they are. Mm -hmm. um, and so while everybody, of course, ends up on the subway or mm -hmm. <laughs> something, you know, the, the actual knowing of people and understanding of people, their culture, um, their values, um, their lives, um, you know, my hope out of this is that there is a real commitment um, to understanding, to educating, um, 
and to respecting um, and appreciating um, other people. Bernice, you have so much wisdom. I've enjoyed speaking with you so much and I could spend another hour or more speaking with you. So <laughs> let me just um, uh, throw out one more closing question. So a lot of people are interested in entering careers in marketing um, or getting to that next job or changing industries or whatever. Um, what's one, one piece of advice that has served you well that you can share with them? Uh, perseverance. Mm -hmm. Perseverance. And I mean that, mm -hmm. you know, I, and I know I go through this story, like all of the, changes and um, shifts were all seamless and just went perfectly fine. People were like, yeah, we want you to come work here. Neither of these big, none of these big changes went like that. Um, you know, when I left Macy's, um, you know, and at this point I'd been a senior leader, I'd run, you know, budgets, huge teams, um, accomplishments, it, you know, it still took a while. Mm -hmm. And I had to really keep my spirits up about it. Um, I had to constantly remember what my skills were. Um, and also to be open, you know, at that point, I think mm -hmm. just retail just was shrinking. So, mm -hmm. you know, it just wasn't yeah. a question of saying, oh, I was there. So now yeah. I'll go there. Uh -huh. um, and really thinking about what my next move could be with an open heart mm -hmm. and spirit. And, mm -hmm. you know, truthfully, as they always say, just going out and speaking to lots of people. Right. Um, you know, right. the one thing I did want to mention, I think the reason that making the shift to a nonprofit or a very different um, industry was also possible is because I had taken on board roles um, for nonprofits. You know, I, I sit on the board for United Way of New York City and I sit on my local um, library, um, Glenridge Library. And, you know, just that commitment to organizations that are doing good work mm -hmm. also gave me confidence that I could bring my skills yeah. into a different setting. So I mm -hmm. think it's just, you know, it's, it's trying to expand everything that mm -hmm. you do and mm -hmm. also persevere. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful, wonderful advice, Bernice. Thank you so much. You're welcome. This it's has been a, been a pleasure. It's been a fantastic, fantastic, um, uh, conversation and also just so so much wisdom there so oh, thank you um, everyone go ahead and put your questions in the chat Bernice I agree with young me's closing remarks so much incredible wisdom in your interview I was so inspired when I first watched it um, and want to thank you for taking the time to share your experiences with us um, it's greatly appreciated and it's going to help a lot of people I mean, you tackled some really important topics spanning what growth and transition and diversity challenge and leadership um, strategies. So we're going to jump right in to the Q&A because I am sure um, a lot of people have questions. And we had questions from um, people that registered. So um, let me ask you the first question based on one of the last comments you made. Um, what advice do you have for someone transitioning in the opposite direction that you did, meaning from nonprofit to for profit? Okay, well, um, so that transition hasn't been my experience, but I think the, the, the skills or the approach kind of stays the same. Um, I think you have to really think about it in terms of skills. Um, you know, any company, and I will say a, a for-profit company is going to be very focused on what value you can bring that matches to what their mission and goals, um, you know, are and, and objectives are. So I think that it's not impossible to do at all, but I think you really have to put your skills in the context of what's critical 
um, to that organization um, as, a, as a profit making organization um, and really demonstrate your ability to be able to make shifts um, in terms of how you operate and how you would be able to bring those skills from one setting to the next setting. And I also, I'm sorry, I want to welcome our uh, co-host here, Young Me Park. Hi, Young Me. You should feel free to jump in <laughs> and say hello. Okay, sorry, I had a calendar mishap, so sorry to join late, but you know, I already had the thrill of the full-blown <laughs> interview with Bernice. I am so delighted to have met her and gotten to know her um, through this opportunity. So yes, I, I would love to share some of the very nice questions that came from the registrants. And so uh, the next one is um, somebody is asking, how she can land, I'm assuming as a woman, I could be wrong, but how she wants, she or he wants to know, how can I land a marketing job from home? Because we can't go out. So it's hard to go to, you know, regular networking events and um, Zoom networking events are nice, but it's a little bit different than meeting somebody in person. So I think that's probably where this person is coming from. So your words of wisdom. So, I mean, definitely this is not like any other time that I think we've experienced in our lifetimes to date. Um, so I, my advice would be really just to, to still try and do the, um, the elements of networking that, that can work. I think you have to mine your LinkedIn network. I'm, I'm gonna put in a plug for LinkedIn. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, I think you, you still have to do that work of looking back through every um, role that you've ever had, relationships that you've had, people that you've met. Um, I mean, a, a lot of job searching, whether you're at home or able to go out, is just putting yourself out there. And I don't, believe me, I'm not saying that like it's easy, because I don't think it's easy. Um, but I think, as I said in the video, I do think it is about persevering um, and you know, looking to see who else you've known and telling people not trying to hold it inside and say like, oh, I'm looking for something. I think you really have to tell people, I'm looking, I need help, I'd appreciate your help, um, and, and follow up on any advice um, and contacts that you're able to get. That, that's really excellent advice. And um, I would add to that, don't discriminate because you don't know mm -hmm. who knows what or who knows who. So um, wonderful. Uh, Natalie Lorenzo, congratulations. She just graduated from college, it sounds like. And she would love to hear your thoughts on um, how you recommend college graduates navigate this changing job market. You know, it's a very difficult time to graduate right now, right? Yeah, yeah so um, I'm gonna admit, it's been a it's been a minute since I graduated from college. <laughs> um, but I would, I would advise, you know, um, I don't know which college and I don't know how um, strong your, your um, career services or, or job placement teams are, but, um, you know, sometimes you really have to push them um and you know really come to them with what you're looking for and looking for very specific advice or contacts that they may have um asking them for alumni or alumni who who work in the field that you may be interested in um i do think and i will say this having gotten phone calls or emails over over my career from um, about to be graduates or recent graduates, you're not networking with people to ask them for a job. You're, you're networking with them to either ask them for advice or for, um, you know, here's, here are steps that I've taken. Um, what would you recommend perhaps that I do next? Um, or I have been volunteering or I've been, and I know internships are not easy to get either. So none of these things I think are, you know, like easy peasy, snap your fingers and they're there. 
Um, but I think when you are able to, to get to somebody to ask for that type of advice on next steps or for looking and to see who they may be contacted, connected with and see if they'd be willing to connect you after you give them a very short but you know pointed um, pitch as to who you are um, to follow up and then to follow up with a note of thanks um, you know, all of those pieces are a lot of time. And that's why when I say perseverance, it's not just, you know, sort of like, oh, I got knocked down on this. And, you know, I don't know if I can pick myself back up. A lot of the perseverance is the amount of time and all of the steps and all of the follow up that also becomes critical to do, particularly mm -hmm. if you don't have as much of um, a knowledge base or, or track record behind you, but don't give up. And here is a related question that seems very important. What advice do you have about creating support networks? Yes. So um, I think for everyone that's going to be different. Um, you know, for me throughout um, different job search or, or shifts in careers or, or just when things are going on, um, my family has been an incredible support network always, and I thank them for that. Um, um, also friends that I've had um, since my college days have, have always been a great support network. Um, but also I think people that I've worked with um, in different, um, different companies, I've kept in touch with them. You know, from every job, there are a grouping of people um, that I've kept in touch with. And you know, I really encourage people to, to really, to keep those networks going. Even when you leave a place, don't lose the friendships and the connections. Um, even if you don't know if you'll ever, and I don't want to say have need of it, like it's a transactional thing, um, but you may never know if you're going to see them again. But um, I think maintaining those contacts and networks um, and also looking into them for support when you need them so that you can keep going is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bernice. And stepping back to um, look at things from a broader viewpoint, uh, somebody asked earlier in the audience, what is one positive and one negative change in the field of marketing? that you've recognized um, from your first job to the present? I mean, you know, how, how has your experience changed, positive and negative? Yeah. So, you know, obviously one of the biggest change that, changes that I think has happened over the years that I've been in marketing is just the impact of technology. Um, and, and I guess what we would call the, the knowledge economy um, and how that has impacted how people make decisions um, and the speed at which people make decisions. And in some ways, the um, abdication of, of a human element to making those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, that shift has been both good and bad. You know, I think the ability to know so much more about people than perhaps we did, you know, when in the beginning of my career when you were doing, um, you know, quantitative and qualitative research and, you know, gathering insights in that way and trying to pull together what your strategy should be. Um, some, there's, there's certainly a lot more that you're able to mine from a technology platform. That being said, I still think it's incredibly important to bring that human touch and understanding um, that the data is still coming from people and their behavior. So, you know, to not just say like, oh, well, the data tells me this, so I'm just gonna follow that path without really thinking about how does that play out in, in people's real behavior? You know, why, did, why is the data showing me what it's showing? What behavioral um, elements are there that have created that data? Mm -hmm. So I, it's neither to me like a good or a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's just a, uh, a recognition and 
um, a recommendation for marketers to always have both of those things mm -hmm. um, within your toolkit. Mm -hmm. Very wise, very wise. And one last question, and this one is turning back to you because we have so much to learn from your, your deep personal wisdom. Um, so somebody would like to know, how do you manage a balance and I think that you really um, represent this in such a such a wonderful way, a balance between being humble and having ego. Because you can't you can't rise in society, you can't be it's hard to be a leader without ego. But you know, um, lots of leaders have too much ego. And so you <laughs> see you seem to be a perfect balance of being humble and having ego. So some insight about that advice. Well, thank you. Um, I think, so I do hope that, um, that, I've, that I think of ego as, um, I tend to think of ego as more confidence Mm -hmm. um, that hopefully your, your background and accomplishments give you over time. Um, and so that you're able to tap into that um, when you're not sure of what to do next or when something doesn't go quite right. Um, so, you know, I think of it as sort of like an internal element that, that gives you that push when you need it rather than as something that you weld against other people. Um, the humble piece of it, I think is this always incredibly important to maintain because we are all human and we don't know everything. And I think particularly as a leader, um, and, you know, and I'm glad I said the servant leader as part of, of, of the video, you know, part of being a leader is having enough humbleness to know that you don't know everything. And, you know, that's actually the best way to build a team is to know where there are pieces in your own background or within the team that you are looking to fill with the skills and the abilities and accomplishments of others and to um, heighten those when there's an opportunity to do that and to coach those when, when you're looking to bring them out. So, you know, whether or not that's exactly humbleness, I think it comes from um, in some ways, it comes from having enough confidence to know that you don't have to know everything mm -hmm. and that it's okay to admit that um, and instead to use that in a way that you're building the best team um, and, and leading people to be the best um, that they can be and be successful also. Oh, fantastic, Bernice. Thank you so very much. Um, so we're at the end of the hour. So let me turn it back to um, Karen and Esther. I, I just realized my name popped up as Esther. So sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. So thank, thank you, young me. Thank you, Bernice. Um, I hope New Yorkers will take some time to learn more about the wonderful work that the New York EDC has done for our city. And thanks again to uh, Smartling and Green Book for their partnership and support. And I want to say a special thanks to Esther Elkwis, who's our networking chair. Wave, Esther. <laughs> um, she's the driving force behind the Women in Marketing series. This was a sold-out event, a live event that is blossoming into a platform that truly ce celebrates women like Bernice. So we hope you enjoyed um, this event today. Our next virtual conversation will be on July 23rd where we will welcome Jenny Fernandez. Uh, she's the VP of Marketing at Logo Brand Food Products. We're constantly updating our calendar. Uh, we're hosting a open discussion tomorrow to help marketers understand their powerful role in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And next week is a research-backed webinar on post-COVID marketing, followed by a career readiness summer camp to help marketers through this unprecedented time of career transition. Again, if you are not a member, we'd love for you to join us. We're here to support you. Thank you all for attending today and have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>